Hey there gang, time for another comic book unboxing. If you take a look at this box right here that I'm about to crack into it, it kind of looks like it could be a, a mix of just about everything. What is in here? I have no idea, but if you like comic books, stick around. We're going to have some fun. Hey there, Bubby. Welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is another unboxing video. You know the spiel by now. I have no idea what is in this box that I have been given the grade for sale on eBay. We're going to make that discovery together and uh, find out what gems we might have in here. The seller name on eBay is .com Comics, if that should interest you. But again, not really trying to sell you anything, just trying to share the joy and love of comic books. So Let's not waste any time. Let's crack right into it. And let's see what we have. Oh, my goodness. I almost forgot. <laughs> Here we go. Got to have more Drew to help me out. See if I can get him to stand up. There we go. All right. So, Web of Spider-Man number one. I remember when this book came out, and I bought five copies. <laughs> I thought I was going to buy a house. Uh, because... You have to uh, you have to keep in mind that at this time there were not you know five thousand Spider Man books every every single month. Uh, there were two ongoing titles, Amazing and Spectacular, and uh, this book, if I recall correctly, replaced Marvel Team Up on the schedule, and so it was the first number one. It was the first number one uh, with the black suit. A lot of uh, a lot of thought that this was going to be a big big book. You know, within the, uh, I don't know if within the greater collecting community, but certainly within my small circle, uh, <laughs> we really thought this book was going to be a big deal. I eventually traded off four of those copies. <laughs> did, never did buy a house with them. Uh, but, uh, well, there you go. Um, the best laid plans, right? This is a, a newsstand copy, as you can see with the UPC code here. So this might... This might, you know, go on eBay for a little bit more, a little bit of a premium over the uh, direct sales edition. This book, as I recall, kind of languished for a long time, but it has started to pick up in uh, in recent years. Uh, this one does well, and I don't know why. I think it's just the uh, Gray Hulk appearance. I don't think it's a key by any means. This one really, uh, frankly, <laughs> my opinion, this shouldn't even be in... Uh, in a box of books to be uh, graded and sold as singles. This is this is like a three or four dollar book, you know, which is almost not worth selling as a single because we we tend to lose money between the cost of uh, handling and grading and listing and shipping. Any less than seven or eight bucks on a book, and we're kind of losing money. Uh, and I'd be interested to see what that does, but I bet it doesn't get to ten bucks. And you've heard me say every box has at least one spawn in it, but spawn is dependable. There's a million of these out there, but uh, that'll still go for probably, you know, 15, 20 bucks. New Mutants Annual number two. This is the first U.S. appearance of Psylocke. So that does well. And again, it's a new stand copy. Direct sales copy on Amazing Spider-Man 298. Is this the first McFarlane issue? I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. Here's a dependable seller, the Wolverine miniseries by Frank Miller. First issue, second issue, a new stand. Third issue, also a new stand, and a nice looking third issue. You've heard me say before, this is a tough book. Because of that black cover, it tends to pick up, or at least highlight, reduce the eye appeal of uh, any little ticks along the spine. So that's a pretty good looking copy. Here's the fourth issue. Oh, wow. <laughs> got, got a little excited there. This is the uh, the last uh, Steve Ditko issue of Amazing Spider-Man. He quit at this point. It looks like, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, if I hold it just right under the light, somebody has taken what appears to have been a ballpoint pen and traced the figure. Or they might have done it with a piece of vellum and pressed down to draw it on something else. I'm not sure. That's unfortunate. But still, that's a highly collectible issue. That'll do well. Let's take a look at Steve Ditko's last panel. Just like his last Doctor Strange story, there's the, uh, there's the main protagonist kind of walking away a little forlorn. 
makes you think that Steve really didn't really want to quit, <laughs> you know, or at least he didn't feel great about it. Just felt like it was something he had to do, I guess. This cover, by the way, is made out of uh, made out of uh, clips from the interior artwork. Um, the legend is that Steve did not turn in a cover for this issue, and so Stanley had to had to make do as best he could. All right, Tales to Astonish. The later issues of uh, Tales to Astonish, uh, along with Tales of Suspense and Strange Tales, don't do all that well. Uh, unless they're in, you know, mid-grade or higher. This will be a little below mid-grade, probably. And, uh, I don't know, that'll probably go maybe 8 or 9 or 10 bucks. Here's an issue of the Thor, the Mighty Thor. A corner missing there. First appearance of the Banshee, who was one of my favorite uh, characters when I first started reading the uh, X-Men in the uh, mid-70s. This wow, this is different. What the heck is this? Oh, this is a this is an English book. You can see because of the uh, price here, ten pence, I guess is uh, what the P stands for. And so this looks like this is a uh, a UK reprint of some Avengers books. Big old big old book. Oh, and it's in black and white. Oh, and it's not just Avengers stuff. It's a lot of what looks like fifties. Marvel stuff. Is there any Avengers in here at all, or is that just the cover? Oh, there is an Avengers story in here. So it is the what about uh, Scorpio, or did you hear the one about Scorpio? Huh. Interesting. Well, here again, uh, talking about the X-Men and uh, Banshee, uh, although he was kind of on the way out already at this point. That is uh, early appearance of Alpha Flight. There is uh, the Eagle Award. And it was right about the time it was uh, sporting the Eagle Award on the cover that X-Men really started to kind of take off. This one is interesting. This is uh, the first appearance of the Huntress, although I think it's actually tied with an issue of All-Star Comics. I'll have to look it up. I'll look up in a Mike's Amazing World, the release dates. But I think this is actually either, although it is listed a lot of times as her first appearance, this is the Helena Wayne uh, Earth 2 version of the Huntress. In my mind, the only real Huntress. <laughs> um, I, I, again, I'll have to look up and see the release dates. But I think this is actually either tied with an issue of All-Star Comics or might have come out a a week or two after my interest as a uh, as a legion of superheroes fan this issue also chronicles the first case of the legion a lost story if you will and there's also an origin for green arrow so that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty special book all right let's take a look at the next stack ooh this one's nice this one's nice. And this is right from what, you know, I call my prime golden age, the 30, 35 cent era. I would have been, this is 77, 78. I think this one's actually 77. So I would have been about uh, nine years old. You don't see many nine-year-olds reading comic books these days, unfortunately. But uh, that was kind of the, uh, the entry level when I started reading comics, you know, seven, eight, nine. This is a return of Deadshot uh, coming back after many, many years. I believe this is his first, I think it might be his second appearance overall and his first since the 50s. I'll look that up and leave a note down below. This is a classic issue. This is part of the uh, Steve Englehart, Marshall Rogers run, The Sign of the Joker. Classic cover. Right up there with the Joker Fish one. It's another Englehart. Uh, Marshall Rogers Detective. This is, I think this is Frank Miller's first Daredevil, or first uh, first on the series. Here's another Detective number 476. Not in quite as nice a shape. It's got an unfortunate stain there, some kind of water damage. The Atom number 9. And I was right about this box. We are kind of bouncing all over the place. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> I guess we are bouncing all over the place. Buster Brown comic book. This was a uh, a giveaway book. Uh, Buster Brown was a, I think it was a, I can't remember if it was a shoe store or a brand of shoe. Uh, but uh, yeah, it had something to do with, well, shoes. There you go, Bowers Shoe Store. So I guess Buster Brown was a brand of shoe. And this was Buster Brown himself. He dates all the way back to the early 20th century, maybe even the, uh, maybe even into the 19th century. I forget how far back he goes. But anyway, this was a giveaway at the, uh, at the stores. So if you went to um, Bauer's Shoe Store in Iowa Falls, Iowa, bought a pair of shoes. I don't know if you had to buy a pair of shoes or not, but anyway, that's where you would get that. You wouldn't buy that on a newsstand. Baby Huey, the baby giant. Boy, this box is all over the place. Number 25. Another X-Men, 112. Two of 112. 113. And this is actually, this is right where I came in. I think my first issue, if I recall correctly, was 111. The issue before this, I think, or was it 110? Where the X-Men were mind-controlled and uh, part of a, of a circus. And, uh, and the Beast came along to rescue them. Which, you know, I grew up viewing the Beast as an Avenger, not as an X-Men. And so learning his backstory, that he actually used to belong to a whole different team. That was heady stuff when I was a kid. <laughs> ah, here's an issue of Scooby-Doo. And this was Steve's issue of Scooby-Doo. Steve H. I wonder what the H stood for. Not sure which issue number this is. This is a Whitman. So this actually would have been uh, most likely on sale in um, in department stores, probably as part of a three-pack, even though it had a price on it. That is where the Whitmans went. And the reason for that, it's actually a gold key book, but um, so that it knew, the company, Western Publishing, so that it knew where its books were coming from when they were returned, it would put a Whitman label on the uh, on the books that went to the department stores the gold key on the ones that uh, went to the newsstand. Of course, the newsstand was still then the primary mode of distributing comic books, and the books were returnable. Anything that was unsold was returned for a credit, or, you know, the top of the book was torn off, and the cover, you know, logo was returned for the credit. Or sometimes, you know, along about this era, the distributor would just sort of, <laughs> it was kind of a take our word for it, <laughs> as far as how many we didn't sell. But so that uh, so that the books didn't get lumped in from channels that uh, were not returnable, such as the department stores, uh, or were at least you know returnable under a different deal. That's why they had the Whitman logo on there. And I have no idea where Whitman comes from. Where does that name actually come from? But that's a story on that. Say a classic issue, and we got two of them: Superman number three seventeen. This is right in the uh, heart of the Kryptonite Nevermore era of Superman. Well, it's looking like he's uh, struggling with a little bit of <laughs> Kryptonite there. <clears throat> Next stack. Next stack. This was a favorite comic book as a kid. This is the second appearance of Scott Lang as Ant-Man. Part two of a two-part story. Not sure where the first one went. If it was in nice shape, it might have gone right to CGC instead of landing on my desk to be graded as a raw single. Howard the Duck 13, what's special about that issue? Well, it is the first, <laughs> and it's funny, at the time it was touted as the first and for a long time afterwards, but then there weren't many appearances after that. Uh, first appearance of the band Kiss in comics. This predates their uh, Marvel Super Special issue that was reportedly made with their blood mixed into the ink. But uh, this uh, there's a last panel cameo in this issue, and then they appear in the next issue? Or is it the other way around? Is it a last panel cameo in number 12, and then they appear in this issue? Kiss and Tell in the Psych Award. So there's a little hint for you. Something's coming up. It's Kiss. Here is the... Uh, First appearance of the 
in what I call the classic Ms. Marvel costume, this, this to my mind is the Ms. Marvel costume that was designed by Dave Cockrum. Would love to see Brie Larson in this just because I know it would kill her. <laughs> Figuratively, not literally, but uh, the uh, the bathing suit and sash. Oh, I love this series when I was a kid, The Micronauts. If you haven't read The Micronauts, do yourself a favor. Get this series. At least the first 12 issues or so, um, the first uh, saga, you know, until Baron Carzer's defeated the first time. Uh, that is just a fantastic run of books. And they're not that expensive, other than the first issue and issue number eight, for some reason, because people think Captain Universe, you know, they still think that's a thing. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those books that went up because people thought it was going to be a thing, and then it just never came down. And people still think it's a thing. But you ask any fan, who's Captain Universe? And they're going to be like, yeah, I don't really know. So why is that book still such a big deal? But other than one and eight, these are mostly like, you know, one, two, three dollar books. Uh, so you can put together this run pretty cheaply, and it is a great, great series. I recommend tracking down Marvel's Micronaut series. Firestorm the Nuclear Man. This is the first appearance of Firestorm, debuting in his own first issue. I bought this one right off the stands when I was a kid, and I loved it. I was heartbroken when it was canceled after only five issues. Not of any fault of its own, but just because, just because of the DC implosion. Here is an appearance of uh, Captain Adam, now a DC character, but then still at Charlton Comics, with uh, some Steve Ditko artwork. And this is 70s. I'm betting this is probably a reprint of some earlier work. I'm not entirely sure. We've got two of them, though. <laughs> so if you really want one, you're going to have uh, coming up here on eBay two shots at that book. Bouncing back, not only to the Silver Age, but, my goodness, almost into the uh, Uranium Age. Superman's Girlfriend, Lois Lane, number 16, still a 10 center. The Kryptonite Girl. Lois Lane, number 19, a little domestic bliss here. Mr. and Mrs. Clark, Superman Kent. Number one of an imaginary series. <laughs> ah, an imaginary story. Here's uh, Superman, Batman, and World's Finest before before he got the Oval. Here's the second part of the classic Days of Future Past story in uh, the X-Men. Sunny. Well, here's something I've never seen in my life before. Sunny. So is it a quality comic or is it IW? Who is IW? I forget. I'll have to look that up. And I think those IW books tend to be... Uh, God, I don't want to say this and get it wrong and have to cut it out of the video. <laughs> if you see a sudden jump here, you'll know I said something stupid. <laughs> Uh, it's usually just, you know, when you see a jump cut in uh, one of my videos, I either was umming and eyeing, tripping over my tongue, or I said something really stupid. <laughs> yeah. And so the stupid thing I'm about to say with this is I think this is a Canadian reprint. I think the IW books were generally Canadian reprints of uh, U.S. books. Uh, sunny, period. <laughs> That's weird. You would think maybe an exclamation point or a question mark, but why Why just a period? That's <laughs> bizarre. Sugar and Spike doesn't get nearly enough love. This is a classic series. Issue 34. I mean, it's a lot like DC's Fox and the Crow. Like, you read one story, you've pretty much read them all, but they're all so charming that uh, you really you cannot fail to love Sugar and Spike. Richie Rich. Ooh, an early issue of Richie Rich. Number eight. Still 10 cents. God. You know, when I was coming up in the, uh, again, as a kid in the 70s, teen of the 80s, Richie Rich had like, I mean, he was like the Batman X-Men, like on crack of his day. <laughs> Harvey Comics had like 40 Richie Rich titles going at once. Uh, <laughs> 
Ah. Oh, look at this next book. This might not interest you if you are strictly a superhero fan, but it's a, uh, it's a fairly early issue of Pep Comics with kind of a weird rounded logo. I don't remember seeing that rounded logo very often. Number 135. Katie Keene, whose recent TV show didn't last that long. Wilbur, who's never had his own show. Little Jinx, never had his own show. And Archie, still going strong in Riverdale. Still a 10 cent book. My Little Margie, and this is a Charlton book. And I think My Little Margie is based on a, a radio show or a TV show. I'm not sure. And what issue number is this? This could be an early issue number because I don't see an issue number on the cover. Although Charlton, Charlton didn't put issue numbers on the cover a lot, so I'm not sure. Life with Archie. What issue number is this? Again, I don't see an issue number on the cover. I'm going to open these up and take a look. Let's see. No tape here to worry about. Take it right out with the backing board. And this is, well, it's number 25. That wasn't that exciting. <laughs> oh, that trouble for nothing. Uh, you might see a jump cut there. Oh, look at this. I've told you before that um, we get all kinds of stuff uh, as comic bags. And this is actually a, a loose leaf folder thing. This went in somebody's trapper keeper. <laughs> and they... They made a makeshift comic book bag out of it. All right, which issue of Life with Archie is this? Got to get to that first page. Number two. Yeah, it's not the first issue. I was hoping it might be. All right, laugh number 103. Laugh number 103. Are you a Betty or a Veronica? Just like the classic questions, you know, Wilma or Betty, Ginger or Mary Ann, uh, Betty or Veronica. I'm not typically a, a blonde uh, fella. Uh, don't go in for the blondes, but I would prefer Betty over Veronica, I think. Veronica is just way too high maintenance. Betty's the kind of girl who's just throw her hair up in a ponytail and let's go hike a mountain, you know? Uh, but I would say I'm also I'm a Wilma over Betty and a Mary Ann over Ginger. Uh, although I love redheads, but again, ginger's way too high maintenance for me. So, not that. <laughs> That'll be another jump cut. Like you, you want to know my uh, my uh, sexual predilections with fictional TV characters? <laughs> Crazy Crow number two is another IW book. Uh, and the reason I wonder if it's, you know, IW or a top quality comic, Quality Comics was, of course, a, a publisher. So is this from Quality Comics or is that just a, an adjective, you know, a quality comic? The publisher, I think, is IW. And maybe it is Canadian reprints of Quality Comics. I don't know. Never heard of Crazy Crow, though. Here's Katie Keene. We were just talking about Katie. It's number 49. Archie's Girls, Betty and Veronica. Uh-oh, who's this chick? Uh-huh. It's number 54. Number 50. I'm going to shoot Archie. Oh, no! Boing! Number 47. 46. <laughs> I was just laughing at the. You always have to. You have to. Uh, you have to read these Archie covers for double double entendres, like the like the classic one about Archie having to beat off three guys to get a date with <laughs> with Betty. Uh -huh. Archie one nineteen. All right, back to Charlton. Space War. It's a Silver Age book. Not sure what issue number. And back to Archie again. Betty and Veronica 109, and an issue of Action Comics 311. Hmm. Huh. All right, next stack.
Here's uh, X-Men, and it looks like there's two books in there. Yep. We've already seen that one. Actually, we've seen that one too, I think. X-Men 4. What is X-Men 4? It's first something that nobody cares about. That'll be like a $2 book. Uh, there's the first Jubilee in X-Men 244. Ah, new X-Men 128 by Morrison. Is that? I hope that's written on the bag. It looks like it is. Okay. 127. It's a little lower grade. 123. Arcane. 113. So that is... Yep, see, there's a, there's a circus, and Magneto comes looking for him. Remember I mentioned earlier they were trapped, mind-controlled, and trapped in a circus? So I guess it's 112 was my first issue as a kid. 108, 128, 136, uh-oh, poor old... Dark Phoenix. 139. Is this? No. It's a classic splash page. Professor Xavier is a jerk. And I can never remember which issue it is. X Factor 6. That is the first full appearance of Apocalypse. 24. I think that's the first Archangel. Which, I'm not a fan of the Metal Wings. I wish they would find a way to put Angel back to what he was. Although he needs something other than just the wings. That's not much of a superpower. Uh, another one of 142, 126, classic cover. 221, first appearance of Mr. Sinister. Ooh, number 100, that's a big deal. Peter Parker, The Spectacular, Spider-Man, number 27. Is there more than one book in here? No, it's just a piece of cardboard. It makes it thick. This is the first Frank Miller art on Daredevil. So that's what makes that book kind of a big deal. We saw one of these already. And this book, I'm telling you, is kind of not a big deal. But I don't know. Ooh, this is fun. Rip Hunter, Time Master, number 16. And look inside, let's look inside. There we go, there's some Rip Hunter fighting um, the Six-Fingered Man. <laughs> my name, my name is Rip Hunter. You kill my father. Prepare to die. Roy Rogers, nice photo cover. What issue number is this? Number 60 from 1952. And there's another Roy Rogers. All right. My goodness, we're getting down to it. Almost done. Here's another Roy Rogers. And a helpful note that tells us this is number 65 from 1953. And I would say March 9th, 2018. Is that when somebody bought this book or put the note in the bag? This has a subscription crease. You see that line going all the way down the middle of the book? That's because during this time period when somebody had a, a subscription to a book, you know, they uh, got it through the mail, the book would be folded right in half and then put inside a, a wrapper. And, of course, nobody, nobody thought of doing that. In those days, didn't think a thing of it, because I mean, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have any aversion to folding your comic book in half any more than you would your daily paper. If only they knew, right? Looney Tunes. Not sure what issue number this is. Oh, it's one fifteen. Somebody thought it was a very good plus. I will be the judge of that. Three dollars. Well, I bet you this is going to go for a lot more than three dollars on eBay. Although. These Looney Tunes books, they don't go for anywhere near their book value um, on eBay. That might end up being like a $10 or $12 book, maybe as high as 20 
but that's a lot less than its uh, book value. And so that might be a good book that uh, you, know, you could uh, flip, send it to CGC. 116, this is an interesting story. <laughs> I think I've told this story before, so I'll try and tell it brief if you're new to this channel and haven't heard this before. But Marvel and DC had a deal to take their books from 15 to 25 cents. They were both going to do it at the same time. And uh, they were going to fill out the books, justify the uh, the price increase by increasing the size of the books and filling it out with either backup stories or reprints, much like DC is doing right now. And DC has gone from $3.99 to $4.99 by adding backups. DC's done this several times over the decades. But at this point, uh, they were again going to make it a larger book to justify the price increase. Well. Marvel went along with it, but only for this one month. Immediately after this, it dropped the price back to 20 cents for a regular size. So for a while, Marvel books were 20 cents, DC was 25, and it was at that point during that year or so until DC capitulated and uh, dropped its book books down to 20 cents. Uh, that's when Marvel overtook DC in sales and has never really looked back since. But up until this point, DC in, in circulation, in sales, still regularly outsold Marvel by a, a fairly wide margin. But it was this little, this little stab in the back, this little betrayal, is what put Marvel over the top. Because, you know, if kids could get five books for a dollar versus four books for a dollar, they were going to go with the, the cheaper books, the Marvel books. And so uh, that's, that's what the deal was there. Detective 398, giant size Fantastic Four, with a nice square spine. These giant size books are notorious for having the spines all crushed and mangled, but that one looks nice and square, so that'll be a that'll be a good book. Daffy Duck, wow, wonder what issue number that is. Number 23, and I just hit the tripod. Sorry about that. And again, somebody thought that was only going to be a dollar seventy-five when it went in this bag. It'll go for much more than that, but not a not a ton more. Again, these Looney Tunes books don't do all that well. Here's ninety-four of Tales of Suspense. This is the first and first full appearance of the New Warriors, which again, a, uh, this is another one of those things where it. You know, a book will go up in value, and then it, it, it never seems to come back down. People still go nuts for these two books. Why? The New Warriors aren't a thing anymore and haven't been for 20, 25 years. You know, do you even know who Night Thrasher is? Skateboard <laughs> riding hero. Speedball's not a thing. Uh, it's a different Nova now, I believe. Namorita's not a thing. Firestar is not a thing. I don't think any of these characters have even been in a book in years. I couldn't even tell you who that guy is back there. But still, people want want these first appearances of the New Warriors, even though the New Warriors are not a thing anymore and haven't been for a long time. Avengers 33. Thor number 140, The Growing Man. That's rather an unexciting uh, moniker. Thor 131, nice cover. 127. 120, oh, and this is still a Journey into Mystery. I think it was 125 was the changeover from Journey into Mystery to just Thor. Oh, nope, I guess it was 126. <laughs> this one is still Journey into Mystery. All right, last stack, my friends. I probably should have uh, divided this box into two videos rather than have this be so long, but oh well. Here's issue 24, Kazar. Nice issue of The Flash, number 156 with the Rogues Gallery. And I don't think they're not yet called the Rogues Gallery here. I wonder what they've called the rogues gallery in the books first, or maybe on the letters page and the fans press. Where did the term rogues gallery 
first appear, I wonder? Here's a Daredevil number 16 with a guest appearance of Spider-Man, probably to help goose the sales. Nice cover of Spider-Man with Doc Ock. G.I. Joe, a real American hero. And this book, this isn't a super high grade book, but this book we get a lot and it's it's usually mid grade. This is something that, you know, this was read by casual readers, kids, um, as much as by collectors. And the ones, the collectors who bought it haven't really let it go. So the copies by and large that are circulating out there are the lower grade copies that were, you know, well read and well loved. This is an issue of what if. The second volume of One If, I think, number 86. Don't know why that one's special. The Marvel Knights edition of Black Panther. Be interesting to see what that goes for. The Marvel Knights edition of Daredevil. <laughs> Kevin Smith. Friggin' Kevin Smith. Finish a story, Kevin. Why don't you? Spider Girl. She was a thing for a hot minute. First issue of Spider-Girl. First appearance of the Red Guardian. And this uh, this issue has taken off with the Black Widow movie coming up. Although it's kind of stalled out with the movie being delayed and delayed and delayed again. And finally seeing you know a lot of clips with the Red Guardian uh, in action. Uh, and so, um, I don't know, that's kind of stalled this book out a little bit, I think. There is the uh, Death of Robin. I was uh, I was around actively collecting at this time. I took part in the phone poll and I did in fact vote to kill Jason Todd. <laughs> so you have me to blame for that. Moon Knight number one. This is a, a direct sales edition. And that's a hot hot book right now. That'll probably go for you know it's uh, that's seven seven five maybe an eight. That'll, that's going to go for 30, 40 bucks. And the last book in the box is a, an issue of the Black Knight, actually an issue of Marvel Superheroes, number 17 with the Black Knight. And uh, this is mostly a reprint book, so I don't know if this is the Dane Whitman Black Knight or if this is reprinting some of the um, Joe Manley Black Knight stories from the 50s when it was a different Black Knight. Not sure. I'll have to crack it open and take a look. But this book does well now, again, because Black Knight with, uh, what's his name, Kit Harrington? Good name. <laughs> That's it. That is that, uh, that is that box. So, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time to watch uh, with me and going through that little uh, journey through wholesome comic book goodness. Uh, we'll see you uh, in the next video. And until then, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other. <laughs>